Dr. Yatu, thank you so very, very much for joining us this evening from Srinagar. We are looking forward to this lecture. And you see me beaming and smiling for another reason as well. Ladies and gentlemen, today we complete a hundred Zoom talks since we went into lockdown in March 2020. You all know that we are an NGO. We work with volunteers. We're so grateful to each and every speak of our 100 speakers for acceding so generously to our request over these past 24 months and giving us some of the most scintillating lectures that we have heard, original scholarship, uh, not heard or recorded before in books. It's, some of it was uh, research in progress. So thank you very, very much for giving us this uh, wonderful opportunity at the Museum Society of Bombay. And a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Yattu, on behalf of the chairman of the CSMVS and the trustees. On behalf of the Director General, Mr. Sabyasachi Mukherjee and the staff of the museum, on behalf of my own committee at the Museum Society of Bombay, are several members and their guests who have joined us here this evening on the Zoom talk. We extend a very, very cordial and warm welcome to you and we're looking forward to your lecture, as Jason said, on Northern Neolithic. A few words about our scholar this evening. Dr. Mumtaz Yatu has done his PhD from the University of Leicester, United Kingdom School of Archaeology and Ancient History, funded by Ford Foundation International Fellowships Programs in New York. His MPhil was from the University of Kashmir, Srinagar, and in India. He's been a visiting academic in the School of Philosophical and Historical Inquiry, University of Sydney in Australia, and held a fellowship from 2007 to 2011, awarded by the Ford Foundation International Fellowship Program in New York for pursuing higher education. His scholarship is really, really renowned, and he has a number of publications to his credit the most recent one is a publication in a report, a scientific report in Nature Journal, which was the paleo environmental proxies indicate long term development of agro pastoralist landscapes in inner Asian mountains. We're indeed really very honored to have you, and we're looking forward to your lecture and your slides. And as I say, what are we going to hear this evening from our distinguished speaker? Just a few words about that. We all know Kashmir Valley is an important region sandwiched between South, Central and Inner Asia, holding a large number of sites with unique prehistoric material culture, famously called as Northern Neolithic, the title of this talk. Many Neolithic sites have been reported in the last four decades, but only a handful of them have actually been excavated that could fill this vital gap in our knowledge about its origin, or origins and paleobotany. However, the last one decade witnessed a spurt of archaeological works on the scientific lines, and new information is pouring in regarding these unique Kashmir Neolithic sites. We're looking forward to hearing more about the development of these sites and the research that has gone around these sites. So before I say uh, anything more, I'd like to thank Ranjit Hoskote, who I noticed has joined us on the talk this evening because it was Ranjit who has introduced the Museum Society and me to Dr. Mumtaz Yattu. So thank you, Ranjit. Uh, we look forward to many such leads and we're looking forward to this lecture as well. And ladies and gentlemen, it's not easy to do these talks without Zoom. So I would like to thank the entire technical team, always so ably led 
by Jason Johns and Yashraj Aishwarya and his team, Rinalini. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're going to continue a little bit more in this mode until we can get back to the CSMBS. So thank you very, very much, team. And Jason, thank you. I know you'll be giving the vote of thanks at the end as well. Dr. Yatu, thank you so much. And now I hand you over to the technical team. Enjoy the lecture, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Dr. Faruz Aji. Uh, it's indeed a privilege to be uh, or, you know, invited by the Museum Society of Mumbai and present my talk on Kashmir. And um, I'm highly indebted to Museum Society of Mumbai. I'm grateful to Dr. Feroz Aji. I'm indeed uh, you know, grateful to you know, my friend Ranjit. And it's because of him that I'm here you know, delivering this talk to a large section of the people who are interested into the cultural, you know, the history or story of Kashmir. So, and indeed, thank you to um, you know J Jason and uh, you know his co-hosts as well for you know hosting me today. Um, my talk today is about Neolithic, um, and it's it it will be a gentle talk, but it will it definitely has a you know cultural tinge to it. And um, since uh, Kashmir is always in the news, by whether good or bad reasons, but like. So many people are, you know, driven towards Kashmir to see the other perspective of the Kashmir Valley, which is like its culture, its tradition, its history as well. And the last section of what that, that's my personal experience uh, uh, with the people who come to Kashmir as well. So they, the, particularly the tourist community who are interested to see the cultural, uh, you know, the sites of the Kashmir Valley. So I thought, since I am very much interested uh, uh, into the prehistoric phase of Kashmir Valley, so I would like to take you back to these uh, uh, important sites in Kashmir, which has a wider connection, uh, you know, beyond Kashmir as well, and which has, it's, you know, which are quite enigmatic in a way that it, they have been uh, discussed, defined, analyzed, and since a new work is being um, you know, carried by us, and we have certain new interpretations to us about these Neolithic sites of Kashmir Valley and its wider connections. So I will begin my talk. Um, let me share my slides to you. Uh, I hope you are able to see my slides. Um, so this is my introductory slide. Um, so people might be interested into this photograph as well. This was clicked last year when I was visiting Lola Valley. It was clicked in the last week of May, so almost a year now. And this gives us a perspective. This is, this is the landscape of the Kashmir Valley and it's represented the same way in the other areas as well, whether, whether you go to District Baramla or District Bargam or you know, other places in Srinagar, in the vicinity of the Srinagar as well. And within these, uh, you know, uh, these villages are these enigmatic, these Neolithic sites as well. Not only Neolithic, you know, other sites, but I will say this gives you a perspective, I will say where these Neolithic sites are. So I have a couple of good photographs of those sites as well. And then you can see within this wider perspective how they are placed, uh, you know, in Kashmir Valley as well. So, uh, the people who are not familiar with the Kashmir, I would like to give a brief tour up about it. So these are the Western, you know, the Himalayas, and this is the Pir Panjal range on this side, and then this is the Valley of Kashmir. So for the reference points, this is uh, the Wooler Lake, and this will be the ba Sopur, which is my hometown, and this is the district Baramla, and the red one is Srinagar State. So within this valley, we have these archaeological sites, and but then beyond beyond this valley, we have the connections to these Neolithic sites all along these regions, which you know I will go on, and then you will see how they are inter interconnected to each other. So this is the situation of the valley. The Neolithic is uh, uh, is known in Kashmir Valley by three sites. 
at least you know two are very important, which is Burzuhum and Gufrad. And the third one is Gunsburg. Gunsburg was excavated for the one, one for only one season, but Burzuhum, I mean say it's synonymous with Neolithic. I mean say so anybody coming to Kashmir Valley has some understanding about this Burzuhum. So Burzuhum has seen very good days from 1960 onwards. It was you know, continuously excavated for 10 seasons. And it was, you know, we are fortunate in a way because it was Dieter and Patterson uh, when they came to Kashmir Valley in 1935 and then they were surveying, you know, to understand the landscape of the, you know, of the Indian subcontinent, which wasn't, you know, in India, Pakistan then. So they were trying to figure out the human presence as well. You know, the ice age, you know, and the interrelationship of those ice ages with the human presence as well. So while they were serving Kashmir Valley, they fortunately came across these sites, this Burzuhum site, and they were intrigued by the material culture. So they did, I won't say they, you know, excavation, but it was a dig by them, try to understand what sort of material culture it is. So it basically, you know, uh, you, you know, it was surprising to them. So seeing such sort of medieval culture, which they haven't seen, you know, at other places. And this, you know, invoked the interest of the archeological survey of India later on, and they started to dig at the same site. So the excavation was, you know, carried at Burzuhum by, you know, T. N. Khazanchi. And uh, it, it was, you know, uh, he was assisted by SSR as well, and so many people at Burzuhum. Uh, this is the general, you know, view of the Burzuhum. Uh, it was clicked. Then uh, the landscape has completely changed. Um, you know, many people, you know, uh, who are listening to me today, I don't know if they have come, you know, seen this uh, archaeological site, but this landscape is completely different. There is nothing sort of any material culture on the site apart from this standing manhire and a shed on this side. So the rest of the site is a playing field and uh, uh, we have been trying very hard to you know, protect it and to re-investigate this site. So unfortunately nothing is happening yet, so, but we are pretty hopeful that in future we might be you know, digging again at this important Burzuhum site. So Burzuhum Neolithic site, sorry, uh, Burzuhum Neolithic site, it, is, uh, it has four cultural phases. So you see it's a schematic diagram, uh, you know, drawn. Uh, it has the earlier phases, the Neolithic one, Neolithic second, the third is a uh, megalithic, and the fourth is the early historic. So the excavations, what happened with the Burzuhums, I will give a brief uh, intro about the Burzuhum as well. Since it was, the, it is such an important site and it was excavated for 10 seasons. So all the reports were published by the ASI reports, uh, you know, uh, by Archaeological Survey of India. But unfortunately, you know, like uh, we didn't have a complete report of Burzuhom till last year. So it was by R.S. Fonierji who compiled a complete report and then that was displayed on the Burzuhom site. Uh, but till last year, there wasn't any final report on the Burzuhom. That that's such that is that's really uh, I mean say um, unfortunate with with the uh, with Burzuhom site. But besides that, since we have that information now, this Burzuhom site has another issue. Since the day one it was excavated, we didn't know that T. N. Khazanchi basically reported Neolithic one. In the second season, the chronology was changed and the Neolithic one was ascribed as a ceramic Neolithic. So now, right now, it has been re-aligned uh, and it is said, uh, it's, you know, written as, you know, or it is referenced as the Neolithic one is a ceramic, Neolithic second is Neolithic, ne Neolithic third is, mega, you know, third, phase third is megalithic and phase fourth is early historic. So the excavations revealed the fourfold cultural sequence, phase one with the chronology beginning at 2,586, and phase second is 2,881. Now there is again, uh, you know, uh, uh, issues with this chronology as well. Uh, that was an issue with Burzum, unfortunately. So it was again rectified because the dates, you know, the 
phase one should be 2,800 and the phase second should be 2,500. But then this date was basically reported from a pit. That's why there is some anomaly with the dates, but it has been rectified. So for the reference, we take 2,586 as the earliest date for phase one, which is a ceramic. And then the phase third is megalithic, 796 BC, and phase fourth is early historical. Um, Burzuhum, that's that was a bit about this chronology uh, uh, of Burzuhum, but what was being reported or what has been reported at Burzuhum, what was so special about this Burzuhum site? So we had, uh, you know, the people, the Kazanchi and his team reported four diagnostic pottery wares from that site, which has been referenced as coarse ware, fine ware, burnished ware, and gritty ware. So coarse ware is the earliest ware, which is phase one. Fine wear is again with the coarse wear towards the fig end of phase one, with the beginning of phase second. Burnished wear is around 2000, and the gritty wear is introduced with the megalithic period at Burzuhum. So we have various shapes, bowls, jars, and you know, uh, those additional stands reported from the Burzuhum site. But the important thing about Burzuhum, about this coarse wear, is because we didn't had a complete, uh, you know, representation or how these, you know, pots look like. But the coarse we had had having, you know, the sand fillers to it, and it was said that these coarse wear pots were mostly used for storage of the stuff and and cooking purposes. Then we went on for the fine wear, burnished wear, and gritty wear pots as well. And apart from these uh, 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 these uh, pottery types. We did have stone tools from the Burzum sites, which are again something special about these uh, Kashmir Neolithic sites. These stone tools or the cells or the hand axes, they are ground. They are so finished. They, they, are, they have so luster. I mean, say, uh, these are the black and white photographs. We have very good samples at Central Asian Museum at Kashmir University and then the, uh, you know, uh, the State Museum at Srinagar. These cells are highly lustrous with where they have the sharp cutting edge. So we have a repertoire, we have uh, you know, axes, we have chisels, we have points, we have large and small mace heads, cones and pestles, harvesters and so forth. And the large section of these stone tools represent or indicate that these Neolithic people were towards, you know, towards the agriculture. So these were sort of a majority of these tools were agricultural tools. Besides these stone tools, Brzuhum was again important because it wasn't only about the pottery and the stone tools. We had a large number of bone tools from these sites as well. So we have bone tools such as double-edged picks, we have needles, we have harpoons, harvesters, spear points, and so forth, indicating that these people were into fishing, they were into swing uh, clothing or leather making as well. So you know, uh, uh, you know, they had a, they, they had those specialized craft as well. So and even in fact, these tools were the boon tools. They were sometimes decorated as well. Besides, you know, these uh, uh, tools from the Burzuhum, we had you know how these Burzuhum people were connected within the larger region of the South and Central Asia. Uh, from the phase one and the phase second, we had the important indicators that these people had connections. They knew they, about their neighborhood. So what was being reported from these two periods was the Hornidity, or we call it the Cordesian port, which was which is very peculiar to the Cordesi or to the Harappan site, which is Cordesi and Harappan site. So this was this is a peculiar pottery of, of Harappans, but then this was reported from the Burzum site, indicating that somehow these Burzum people and the Harappan people, you know, they were interacting to each other. And besides that, Harappan port, we had a black uh, and red ware uh, reported from phase second at Burzum, which was a port filled with carnelian beads. And again, I mean, say we had carnelian from Harappan sites such as Chanodaro, uh, from, from the Harappan sites as well. So again, you know, this is again a uh, an important indication that these people were, you know, uh, were, were very well aware or the people on the fringe of the Neolithic or within this neighborhood knew that these people, you know, existed somewhere. And again, these are some important, uh, you know, pottery or 
we call this the fine beer, which is highly sedative. We call it sometimes the combed beer as well. So it is, it has a fine texture, but then it has the combing design on the outer surface of the wall. But the best thing about this fine beer is that again, uh, it gives us, you know, it somehow makes Neolithic something unique are its bases. Its bases are mat impressed. So we have, we know through these sort of material culture, we can have a peep and glimpse of these Neolithic people in the past. So we understand that this matting or this clothing was already in vogue during that time. I'm mean, saying they were making, you know, those mats at that time, because once they were making those pots, they were placing on those pots and then they were going to, to, to the kilns. So once we see those pots, they have perfect mat impressive, you know, bases to them, which is again, something specific to these Neolithic sites. Besides that, we have engraved uh, uh, these um, uh, rock, you know, slabs found at Burzuhum. Uh, one is very important. I'm say all the people might have seen it. Most of the people might have seen it, and it's discussed everywhere. It was represented as, or it was, you know, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, it was said that this indicated um, a hunting scene. So it was suggested that it was a hunt by the Neolithic people, and the dog was around, and the sun was around, and the second was just. I'm um, say graffiti, it couldn't be, you know, uh, you know, my sense couldn't be made from that slab as well. But since this, we have some different interpretations about this rock uh, slab. Uh, it was lately published by the Guardian as well. And there is a paper published, uh, the, the, the study was published in Indian Journal of History of Science, that this wasn't a hunting scene. These were two sons and it was a supernova, HB9 supernova, which exploded some 4,600 BC. So this is something again, apart from, I mean, say there are other papers published on the archaeoastronomy uh, of the Burzum as well, but we could understand or we could sense that these Burzum people had some understanding why some, because they were into agriculture, they were into domestication, they obviously need to track the seasons. So they uh, obviously were looking at the cities as well to, you know, see, the orientation of the suns and possibly if we go by this publication that this was HB9 supernova and possibly these people saw it, represented it and that's how it is. So people, anybody wants to learn more about it, it's published on the Guardian uh, itself. And besides these, uh, we have evidence of metallurgy at uh, this Neolithic at the Burzuhum site. We have a number of tools. So from there, we have few copper uh, arrowheads, a ring, bangles and a pin with a flattened coiled head were found from period second. Again, uh, it was said that these were basically because of the interactions with the outer world or within the surrounding regions. So there wasn't a large scale of, of, of these tools found from the Burzum site, but a limited number of tools, but then metallurgy, like in terms of conception, if we see that these were uh, tools which were, uh, which were made we didn't have any uh, you know, representation for Burzuhum, whether there was smelting going on, whether there was ore around, whether these tools were made or smelted at the site. But so we possibly, so many people give different you know, interpretations to it. And, but like I'm mean, saying, these people had an understanding you know, into this metallurgy as well. Besides all this, people at Burzuhum, they were burying their dead. We have, uh, several uh, graves at uh, Burzuhum excavated. We have certain graves where uh, the bodies were buried with dogs. So I may say again, uh, which was which was something very unique. It wasn't seen, you know, uh, it wasn't observed not only at Burzuhum but then to, you know over the East Asian sites as well, a few sites as well. Uh, but that was an important thing to note. Uh, besides this, uh, we have seen. Uh, at Burzuhum that the female skeletons with their, that were excavated from the Burzuhum article sky had those trepanation marks on their skull. And it was said that possibly it was, uh, you know, the people were into early surgery, possibly relieving pain or shamanism or something, we don't know, but this definitely, they definitely were doing, you know, something, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, with these humans. Uh, it, is, uh, it is understood that, you know, these drilled holes have never healed and possibly if any of the individuals were suffering with the pain, they have possibly died with the drilling of these holes, unfortunately. But like I mean, say, this was the scenario 
you know, at the at, at Burzuhum. Apart from this material culture, uh, what we know from Burzuhum is crop remon, uh, remains from the Neolithic period one, which consists mostly of cereals of West Asian origin, primarily wheat, and then barley. We have pulses represented by lentil. Uh, this composition con cont continues much the same during Neolithic second. And what we see during, you know, megalithic or the third phase at Burzuhum is the introduction of the rice. So right now we are into rice eating, I mean, say the staple diet is rice, but it wasn't, you know, some four, 5,000 years before present, which was, you know, uh, roughly this uh, West Asian um, uh, stuff. Uh, so what was the overall scenario at Burzuhum? It was you know, the phase one which we called as Neolithic one, or sometimes we call it as aceramic Neolithic. We had pit houses. Then during the early Neolithic, we have four spheres and pit houses. In the, during the middle Neolithic one, we had appearance of fine combed wear, as I said before, and then the introduction of the black bone shed wear. Neo, middle Neolithic second, disappearance of pit houses, appearance of above ground houses, and the neo, ne, late Neolithic, which are the megaliths, we see the introduction of red gritty wear. And the megaliths are represented by those standing stones at the Burzuhum. Now, the important thing, which I didn't mention till now, was Burzuhum was not only known by all this material stuff, but Burzuhum was also important because it was said that, you know, once the Burzuhum was excavated, that there were pits and they were ascribed as dowling pits. So we have conical pits and we have scar pits from Burzuhum. So it is said that piece of people possibly used to, to you know, delve into those subterranean pits during phase one and second and during the last, during the uh, later phase of the phase second, they came over ground. Now, uh, since we are doing a different uh, uh, sort of stuff, which I will discuss with you, our understanding about those doweling phenomena is, is, is uh, something different. So I broadly, uh, you know, uh, see them as, uh, as uh, storage pits or granaries rather than dwelling pits. And I have my, um, you know, hypothesis or my interpretations for it, but I'm say the work is going on. Uh, so, uh, you know, and uh, we have those very important results pouring in where we see that possibly they were more sort of granaries than, you know, dwelling pits. Uh, besides Burzuhum, the important, uh, uh, another important site was Gupra. Uh, you know, uh, excavated by uh, 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 by um, A.K. Sharma and K.D. Banerjee. Uh, there isn't much uh, uh, remaining uh, uh, at, at the Gupkral site, unfortunately. It's quite far from the synagogue. Uh, I was there at last year. It's in a really ba bad shape. Uh, the, it, it's not yet protected. Uh, it has got a protected, stay, you know, uh, a board. Uh, by the by the state archaeology department, but I didn't see much work um, at the site. Uh, but you know, besides this, um, this is a bit recent photograph. We have those men hires lying on the ground. Uh, on the opposite side of this site uh, um, is a, is a military cantonment, and then we have these uh, uh, few standing stones there. And unfortunately, nothing more than that. But what was reported, reported at Gufkral uh, is uh, we have a five cultural uh, period sequence, or we could say three cultural periods. One is bifurcated cultural period one, which is Neolithic is bifurcated into three, while we say period one A as e aceramic Neolithic, no issues with that. And then one B is early Neolithic, one C is mature Neolithic. Period second is megalithic and period third is early historical. There, uh, uh, you know, the Gufral, once the Gufral was excavated, we didn't see any changes, but was reported in pottery wise. We have four, you know, domesticated, uh, uh, you know, those pottery, four uh, types of diagnostic pottery wares uh, reported at Burzuhum, the same pottery types were reported at Gufral. We have the same typology stone tools reported at Gufral. We have same bone tools, you know, uh, reported at. There wasn't any, you know, any greater shift or change in the material culture between those sites, between these two sites. We have the dowling, those pits, again reported at the, you know, Gufral Neolithic sites. What was being, what was new at Gufral was the introduction of rice, which was a bit early than Burzuhum. Uh, 
uh, at, at, at book crawl and a small number of iron points were recovered from the megalithic levels. And the dates for the iron goes very early at, at book crawl site. And it was at certain point of before, uh, you know, the excavations in UP, the reference point for early introduction of iron into, into, into South Asia, I would, you know, went to, to this book crawl site. So this, it was, you know, the later on when the, you know, this uh, UP, uh, the sites in UP were excavated, the, the introduction of the, the chronology to the iron has, has gone beyond what was being reported at Gufral. So the important thing with the Gufral was, again, a similar material culture, which was earlier reported at Buk, uh, you know, Bomai, only we have, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, iron, the introduction of iron at Gufral and, you know, early introduction of rice. The systematic study of botanical remains suggests agricultural activity that can be traced to a ceramic period with a package comprising of barley, wheat, lentil, and pea, with rice introduced in the final stage of the Neolithic 1C. Wheat seems to be the dominant cereal at, 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 at Gufra. Besides this, we have the, uh, you know, the, from the aceramic phase, uh, which is dated to around 2689, which is earlier than Burzuhum. This is followed by the pottery fabrics, which include, again, coarse wear, fine wear, black wear, and, you know, gritty wear, which is introduced at the fake end of, of Neolithic. Among the stone tools, uh, we, which uh, we, uh, we, we again have uh, axes, we have chisels, points, large and small mace heads, spoons, and pestles, harvesters, uh, double edged picks, needles, harpoons, spear points. These sort of, I mean, say, this is the material culture which one of my students, when he was doing work at this site, he is basically a native of the village, and a bulldozer was excavating there, and he just he went there and collected these tools from that site. I'm um, say so there wasn't any chat, unfortunately, to that, but I'm um, say this is sort of a material culture that is that still comes out from that you know important Neolithic site in in, in South Kashmir. And um, uh, what uh, you know, as I was saying, that it was in phase second that iron makes its first appearance at Bufral. Earlier, it has been suggested that this was a result of diffusion from Iran, Afghanistan, citing examples of Malik at Iran, Galige at Pakistan, Mundigak at Afghanistan, and so forth. Since now the UP is excavated and we have all, you know, uh, the, this uh, story of iron has completely shifted from uh, Burzum, uh, from Gufral. And another important site, this Kanispur, which was uh, excavated by BR Money in 1999, it was excavated in a single season. We, again, uh, it was a thick 20 meter uh, deposit and a, a ceramic phase was reported uh, from there and which, you know, fortunately, this is the only site which takes the aceramic phase of the Neolithic to 3,498, which is way too early. And then we have the, you know, uh, Neolithic phase second, and then we have early historical phase uh, at, you know, which is represented by the Kushan period at, at Kanispur. So besides, you know, we have the earliest date to the aceramic at uh, you know, of uh, aceramic site in Kashmir Valley, the, in the botanical remains, I mean, in terms of stone tools or in terms of uh, pottery, it's again the same story what has been represented or reported from Burzuhom and reported from Gufra. So in, bot in, 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 in botanical terms, we had, uh, you know, from period second, uh, we had barley with small numbers of com compact, the, you know, uh, uh, triticum, estuvum, and oblique uh, durum beads and three emmer beads. So somehow, you know, Lentil was, uh, you know, report from, the, uh, from there. The emmer wheat was the first time that this wheat was, you know, represented or reported from any Neolithic site in Kashmir Valley. Again, the analysis, uh, you know, pointed, shifted our view to the, you know, dry farming in the Kashmir Valley. And it was said that possibly because these are the dry, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 these cultivars, you know, are being cultivated in the, in the dry lands. And this is possibly a diffusion from those regions to the Kashmir Valley. But since the sample size was very low, I mean, say we have only three, uh, you know, triticum uh, emmer weeds, you know, report, report from this site. Um, a, a possibility is there if we go further, you know, excavate this site, uh, we might have something else to add up to this knowledge. But that is, this is how, this is what we know about the Neolithic people uh, of Kashmir Valley from the excavated sites by the ASI in Kashmir. So all the information till now 
is reported, is published it in the ASI reports, and there are a large number of uh, you know publications, books uh, uh, published there, and that is what we you uh, we know about the archaeobotany of these regions as well. We didn't know anything beyond this from these important sites. Uh, if we bracket those sites and or if we see the chronology of these sites, so for the Kanispur site, you could see, you know, where they are placed between the 4000 and 1000, uh, you know, uh, uh, BC. Uh, we go for Kanispur, we have the earliest date. For the Burzuhum, this is deleted. This is not being considered. So we have the earliest date from Burzuhum. Then they all other sites fall within, within you know, the similar time bracket. Uh, these are not the only three sites which were, you know, um, reported in Kashmir Valley, but there were 40, uh, 43 Neolithic sites till date which have been reported in Kashmir Valley. Unfortunately, the I have been I have traveled, you know, throughout Kashmir region, and if you see, if you recall my earlier photo of the Kashmir Valley, you see these sites how they are, you know, placed within the larger landscape region of this Kashmir region, but. The unfortunate thing is because the three sites, Burzum was excavated, but very little remaining at the site. Gufkral is almost gone, I would say. Kanispur, nothing there apart from those publish publications, what we have. And all these rest of these Neolithic sites have no information, you know, whatsoever available, either in books or on, 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 on ground. So I have been on most of these sites. People don't have any idea, background about what I am searching for, or why these sites, sites were important. I mean, say nothing, completely decimated the, the, the sites. So, which is really unfortunate. But since, uh, uh, you know, 2006 onwards, uh, it was like, um, fortunately, somehow it was my PhD work that I was driven towards, uh, towards the systematic surveys in the Kashmir region. and. Uh, uh, it was during my PhD program that I had quoted around nine, ten Neolithic sites, uh, you know, besides many early historic and later historic sites as well, and a couple of Paleolithic sites as well. So the current, you know, like the whatever the sites I'll be talking to you is 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 um, have been reported during the PhD program, and then I had this uh, tie up with the University of Sydney, and wherein we are further probing those sites because. These are the sites which are on the brink of extinction. So we, right now, we want to, you know, we want to document as much as we can so that at least, you know, it is reported uh, uh, in the publications that at least we have some understanding why, um, you know, how these Neolithic sites were important. So this, our project was, is, is bifurcated into three phases. Phase second, st once stage one is completed, stage second, was dragged because of um, because of the situations in 2019 in Kashmir and then the COVID, uh, which happened around 2020. So we are basically winding up this stage, and we were into first stage third. So uh, you know, um, you know, possibility is that that will start within this year as well. Uh, so this is the you know the representation of these sites, um, uh, these sites in the landscape towards the northern part of the Kashmir Valley. So these are the Neolithic sites, as you can see. And if we put them into, into, a, into, a, into a physical map or a contoured map, you could see uh, uh, where they are. So we have site one is the is Burzum for your reference point. Site two is Gufkral. Site three is Kanispur. These are the ASI excavated sites. Besides site four is the Semthan site, which begins around megalithic, again excavated by ASI and rest of these sites were reported by me during my PhD program. So we basically visited those sites and we, our understanding about the Neolithic in Kashmir Valley completely shifted. What we already knew about the Neolithians of Kashmir Valley is completely, uh, is, is, is further, you know, uh, you know, taken back. And when, in terms of chronology, we wanted to rectify the chronology. There were issues with the chronology. We wanted to place the paleobotany of these uh, from these regions within proper context. We are, you know, successful in doing that. And so many questions regarding the Neolithic sites of the Kashmir region. 
Uh, one of the important sites which I reported during the program and then we visited again and the uh, at, uh, you know, when I was giving references to those, those, those pits which have been reported at Burzuhum as deviling pits, uh, you could see, I mean, so we have no clue. Even I didn't have such a clue about those deviling pits from the Burzum because nothing is available there. We didn't have any good photographs. We didn't have anything, you know, of such photographs available to us. But that this was the first time I came face to face with those deviling pits, you know, as they have been talked about uh, earlier. So these, this is one of those conical pits, which is broader at the base, a bell-shaped pit, broader at the base, narrower at the, at the top. And it is said that, you know, people used to live within those pits, which I had my reservations because these pits have very sharp edges. I mean, say it was so difficult to get in without any landing steps or without anything and sting, a, a family sting within this pit. So, you know, what my, you know, what, one, what one of the you know key questions about these pits was to see whether they had anything to deal with with, with storage or anything. To our surprise, I mean, say we had thirteen layers within one of these pits. I mean, say there are a number of pits lined on this Kareva section. Another important thing about these Neolithic sites is that they are on the on the on 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 this on this important uh, uh, this feature, which in Kashmiri or uh, in generally we call as Kareva. So these are lex strain deposits. So, you know, there is another story about the Kashmir because it was a lake and it was drained. And once it was drained, those these sedimentations were exposed first. And it's on those sedimentations that we find these early settlers, those Neolithic people and those pits on those on, on those Kareva uh, sections. So this is uh, this is an orchard of, a, of one gentleman who is no, known as Mr. Kasim. And he has almost destroyed the site. So I was really fortunate as I was doing a systematic survey, I came across this section. Uh, another, I mean, say it's almost gone now. Uh, I have almost documented all those pits at the site. It's a private property. I'm saying can't do much about it. Uh, can't protect it in terms of, you know, acquiring that land and ASI has other, uh, it's, it's way too difficult to deal with them. Uh, so this is a diagram once this was cleaned, and then this is the labeling of the site. And to our surprise, I mean, say whatever we knew about Neolithic of Kashmir was either Burzum or Gukwal or Kinspur. But this gave us a different perspective. I'm say it was from this site for the first time that we had, this is a course report, that we had a full compact port reported from this site. So I mean, say we didn't have anything you know, report from Burzum, Gukwal, or Kinspur, but this was uh, really a blessing to us that we at least could see how these course we ports looked like, where, whether where, which are interpreted as cooking or storage ports. And then I was talking about those mad impressive bases. You could see how these mad impressions are on the basis of these fine wear ports. This is another you know, uh, cross section of the photograph where you could see the mad impressions on these bases. So what was the so, spe so special about this fine wear was uh, something which gave us an, uh, you know, as uh, impetus. I mean, say nobody was interested into, into what we were doing, but fortunately social media was picking up. We found this port. Uh, I had those, um, I had people around, Professor Allison and Michael was around. So we just questioned, I mean, say it came to us that this port is very unusual. Let's call it Kim Kardashian. And, uh, to our surprise, I mean, say this reached far uh, enough. Uh, it was picked by Indian Express, the Sunday Guardian. It was picked then by Chief Minister of uh, Chief Minister of the State, um, Omar Abdullah, and he commented on it. I must say this was blessing in disguise because nobody was interested to it. People starting to come to me. I'm say Indian Express came in and asked me what's so special about Neolithic sites of Kashmir Valley. So I'm say, I'm you know we are thankful to Kim Kardashian. I'm say. Uh, if not to uh, these Neolithic people at Kassimbog or this course we report, that it made some noise. And say so people became interested, state became interested. I started to, I was being you know, invited on TV channels. I was being you know, invited on radio channels as well. And now largely, whenever, wherever I go, people recognize us. You know, they say, oh, well, you are the people who talk about, you know, these cultural stuff. And they say, well, we have this pottery from our, you know, uh, from our yard or from our orchard. So I'm say it's it's really I'm say sometimes these uh, these things really are you know something blessing. So very thankful to him in that aspect. 
we just christened the fort uh, on the light note. But besides, I'm say Kasimbag was, we were very fortunate. Since we did flotation on, on Kasimbag, so we basically did uh, flotation on all 30 levels at, at the spit. And to our surprise, we did see the Western Asian crops, which was reported at Bozohan, Gukral, and Kernsburg, which is wheat and barley. But the surprising find was broom corn millet. This is the first time that broom corn was reported from any Neolithic site in Kashmir Valley. So dates were a little later, but I mean, say, first time a Western Asian crop and an Eastern you know, Asian crop happening together at one single site. I mean, say, this opened a Pandora's box for us. I mean, say, we really got you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, hooked up to this uh, Neolithic. I'm say uh, we really were surprised to find this, and then we started to do the flotation with the other Neolithic sites. But Kasimbag did. Besides these things, we did have pulse crops, cereal crops from from Kasimbag, did a large stratigraphic estuarium context B8, and you could see. I'm so you could read from it, and then. It wasn't only that we have Western nation crops and Eastern nation crop happening together at one Neolithic site, but besides this, we had other occurrences of, you know, uh, reported at this site. Among these, we have, uh, you know, which was, uh, again, I mean, say this because this, uh, where, but I need, this is important to say here that wheat and barley are the Western nation cultivars by as millet was first reported in China. That's, it's where I'm saying that, you know, these two things from two opposite ends and meeting in Kashmir Valley. So uh, this gave another impetus to us to see Kashmir in a, in, a, in a different perspective, to place it in a Asian context, to place it in a Central Asian context, place it in South Asian context, see how this functioned within this larger, uh, uh, you know, the landscape. Uh, the, the, you know, it wasn't only the millet which was reported from the Pesimbal site. We were fortunate to see bison reported from that site lens uh, reported from that site or tea or you know the, this uh, those letters you know the dal uh, as well as we say reported from there and letters which is again indian tea uh, reported uh, from these sites so again very important finds you know from this kesimbag neolithic site and it didn't stop there we basically reported these grapes from uh, this Kesimbag site as well, the, the, the carbonized seeds of the grapes from there. They have been reported from Loiband is a Neolithic site, is a site in, in Swat in Pakistan, uh, which were reported by the Stakul and his company. They were Ita Italians working in Swat. So they dated it around 1700 and 1400 BC. And they basically, when they were excavating Swat, so their reference point was Burzuhum. So this was really important because now grape, though grape, single specimen of grape, carbonized seed of grape was reported at Burzuhum. But then from Kersimbag, we have the, you know, these uh, grape seeds and then we, they were reported from Swat. They were also reported from Mehrgat in Balochistan as well. And to our understanding, since that port turned up, so we are trying to do, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a chemical analysis on the port to figure out you know, what sort of things these people were doing at the site. So the research is still in, in, in progress, but our only early indicators are that possibly these people were into winemaking. So which is again, something very unusual. And once we have a full story on this, I'm um, say, I'll, you know, we'll be sharing about this as well. And if getting a platform again, that I'll come up with the new results as well. And besides this, we have buckwheat reported on this Kesimbag site, uh, which is again something very important. Uh, we presume that this was being used as an insurance, as a forest crop. You, as I said, those tools at Bulzuhum, they were possibly into agriculture. So all these parameters are indicating that these people were mostly towards uh, towards the agricultural to, to, uh, uh, you know agricultural sector, but we do have you know indications or we do have uh, news about domestications of you know uh, fauna as well such as uh, goat, sheep, and cow. But you know a large you know body of evidence goes towards this 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 early subsistence and uh, towards paleobotany. Uh, this is the 
you know, a large number of species which have been reported from these sites, from, from question mark site. Besides these domesticated grains, we have domesticated pulses, we have this, uh, this bare grape seeds, we have these insurance crops, uh, and then we have a large number of grasses reported from this Neolithic, important Neolithic site at Kassimbal. Uh, this is another important site, uh, which we call as Bumai. This will give you a bit, a bit, a little bit perspective how these sites look like. So these are these, you know, mound shaped, gently mound shaped, and then there is this mountain cropping up. And we, this was the dry bed of Wooler Lake. Now the agriculture is being done on this on this lanes. And this site was this photograph is clicked in 2006, and this site is almost gone till till this area. I mean, say the local people come to this site because they say that soil from this site is 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 very fine, and they use them uh, in, uh, in in uh, in 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 plastering those fire cones, you know, walls and other stuff. I have done a bit of, you know, I'm I'm tired of, you know, uh, going to these people, but you know, uh, it's unfortunately not stopping. Uh, but this is again an important Neolithic site. We, you could see, I'm mean, say how far this is the by the local people. So how far they have gone. So what we did, we scrapped the site. Uh, we documented the site. Again, we have. Uh, we have a similar uh, package, which was reported from Burzum or Gukpral or Kirnispur or Kirsimbar. And we didn't, but unfortunately we didn't report any uh, millets from this side, though we did report uh, some, uh, you know, Western Asian crops such as wheat and millet from, from there. Uh, we have all the pottery types. This is the classical, that one should be a pottery uh, uh, reported, uh, reported from Neolithic sites. Which are which are mostly dish on stand. I'm saying the current prototype of this is we call that as a scans in Kashmiri. That is a copper pot, which is exactly made on the same pattern. We call that as scans. But this is dish and stand of this burn should wear uh, pot. Uh, this was uh, all this was put from there. I'm saying you could see the intricate design on on the neck of uh, this this on the played out rims of this uh, this uh, burn should wear pottery. These were the cells reported from there. And another important site, Turin Tink, which is in Gandharbal. I'm saying this site is so important to us because it has, again, given, I said, you know, uh, opened up a different uh, field to us to look at this Neolithic in a very wide angle. It was, again, I'm saying a similar package, nothing new reported at Turin Tink. The only thing reported. Uh, from the uh, different thing was the earliest dates for, um, for broom corn millet. So for the millet, which has its origin in China, and besides in China, we have now the earliest dates to the, uh, to the millet in, in, in whole of this region. So, you know, you, we could see, I'm um, say how this Kashmir, how these Neolithic sites were operating or, you know, how they were working within this larger, uh, uh, you know, this, this region. So uh, Western Asian uh, crops and the Eastern Asian crops happening together. Now, for the first time, we have the very early dates of this uh, um, uh, millet from this important Neolithic site. Uh, what we know about this millet is that it was cultivated in China uh, around mid third millennium BC. And we have, you know, it was also reported in towards this Tibetan plateau, one of the important sites is Karo. And uh, we are almost, you know, neck to neck with this China. I mean, say, because we are only documenting these sites. What I'm doing is, you could see these people, this is again a private land, they are flattening this area, they are leveling this area. So I'm not really pretty sure in a couple of years that. I will be having anything in proper context to work on. But right now, whatever we have, we are trying to document that as much as, much as we can. So for this, uh, now if we go to, to, to this wider perspective, we see the, the, the mid third, mid or late third millennium BC for this millet. Then we see Kashmir Valley pet printing site, which is happening around 2580 BC. And then we see Kauro site, which is in China, or oh, Tibetan plateau, 2800. BC. I'm say 
we are the second nearest to Chinese uh, sites in, in, in terms of domesticated. But what does that mean to us? Now, if we see if these things in now broader perspective, we see the Western Asian cultivars, you know, these wheat and barley coming from this fertile crescent towards this larger South Central Asian region or Inner Asian region. So we are here in Kashmir Valley where we have wheat and millet, uh, wheat and millet to, uh, with us. And then these are the Chinese sites where this millet has been reported. And it is said that, you know, it has traveled, our hypothesis or our model suggests that possibly it went south, west, and then it possibly came to Kashmir. So what, what we presume is that these Western Asian crops and these Eastern Asian crops, they together met somewhere within the Kashmir Valley. Now we are trying to, you know, to trying to document which route they took. I'm mean, saying that work is in progress. Once we have that information, we will definitely share that with you. But what else, what other information we have about these sites? We have Altai, uh, in the Altai region, we have this fourth, which is, uh, you know, Tontian Dang. Uh, we have number six, which you see is Begash in Kazakhstan. And then we have our Kashmir site. Again, the earliest, it, yellow is wheat and barley and the gray is millet. Wheat and barley and millet. This is wheat and barley and millet. We have the earliest days for wheat and barley from this content then, but then the millets, I mean, say we have important things to deal with. So possibly, is it possible that it has multiple domesticated well, dom domestication points or somehow these Eastern nation crops, you know, traveled via Kashmir Valley to, to the rest of the region. I'm saying that work is again in, in right direction and we have very good results and which we will be very happy to share with. Radiocarbon results, the date ranges show long-term usage of the pit site Kassimbak from around 2500 to 1500 BC, which is consistent with the known archeological chronology of the Neolithic in Kashmir. Unlike Burzum and Guftal, where pit structures were sealed and abandoned around 2000 BC, the use of such pit structures at Kasimbag continued persistently for another 700 to 1000 years as evidenced by the presence of burnt shedware fields. So this is the chronology of all of our sites and you know we have other as well, but this is just for the reference points here. Uh, this is, I will rush through this because I have very limited time with me. If we see Kashmir Neolithic in proper context, then I would go through, I mean, say, if you see the mat interested bases, and we could see the similar mat interested bases from the SWAT sites in Pakistan. The tool typology, this is reported from the Pesimbalk site. This is the Yuntang new sites, archaeological sites. This is the Burzo. I mean, the similar material culture. And this is the SWAT one in, 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 in Pakistan. And then in terms of pottery, if we see, this is the Burzo home, this is the SWAT, and this is the new data from the, the sites I've been working on. And if we see, this is the new data on these burnt shedware, Western Tibet, what they have reported, and then the Kanispura, the, the ASI reported. And if we go again, we see those uh, graffiti. This is Burzuhom, this is uh, Swat, this is the new data I'm working on, and this is the, the, the Tibetan site. And the, uh, for the, if we see this is Burzuhom, nothing, this is the only thing I could show to you, I can show to you, and then Bufkral. And then we have this question about beautiful cross section of this pit. And, sorry. and then we have rice uh, with this rice. I'm saying the only thing which we couldn't uh, see through our analysis from all the Neolithic sites, we couldn't report any rice, certain nice seeds of the rice, but they have been reported by Burzum and Kufkal sites. And then those soon harvesters, possibly they have been associated with harvesting of this um, rice, and they have been reported from in the China as well. So Yangshou cultures. So this is the Loiban. This is uh, from China, and then this is the Burzum connection. And uh, if I bring this up, what uh, I see is the evidence from the new sites at substantial new art artifactual and botanical data for a growing body of studies in South and Central Asia. The stratified nature of the materials gives insight into long-term settlement practices within the valley from sealed and well-dated archeological context. The evidence suggests that the farming, agro-pastoral villages of Kashmir had vast frontiers and multiple and varying routes of exchange with South, East and Central Asia. 
For the kind of research carried at new Neolithic sites, it is learned that similarities in material culture between these sites and the sites in Kashmir, South and Central Asia are considerable and this suggests possible interactions due to migrations and other reasons. The geographic position of Kashmir at a crossroads of communication routes is important, perhaps allowing it to act as a hub between the northern region of Pakistan and Central Asia on the northwestern side and rest of Kashmir on the southeastern side, Burzum, Gukral, and Kranjpur. This centrality is supported by the presence of the key Jalim Valley, uh, Jalim Valley route that passes through Baramla and connects Kashmir with the northern areas of South and Central Asia. Uh, well, that is, as I was saying from, you know, from slide one, that this Kashmir in Neolithic is, is in real danger. This is one of the important sites. Again, uh, I call the, this is at Afarwat, is in Northern Kashmir, uh, in Botingu area. This was visited by me in 2006 and in 2007, eight and nine, by 2010, when I took this photograph, this is the situation of the site. I saw in an earlier mound, it was the site was up to this, uh, you know, it, even beyond this. So it's all gone. And right now it's completely gone. The importance of the site is that with the stone tools, the ground stone tools you have seen, I may say when these tools were made earlier before their grinding, so how did they look like? Those tools were first seen or reported from this site. But I may say we have no cultural context, you know, with us so that we could we could we could do a you know proper stratification, we could dig or we could salvage something from this important site. Or even the a ceramic piece. I mean, say I have reported uh, sun dry pottery from this site. Now this is completely gone. Nothing, nothing, nothing available. So the sort of work, the kind of work we are doing right now with these important sites is that at least we are trying to document whatever we can, so that at least we have reference points to this Neolithic, important in Neolithic in Kashmir Valley. Uh, the time is very limited. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, to MSM and thanks to everybody for listening to me. Uh, I hope it wasn't too long and too boring. But uh, my thanks to Museum Society of Mumbai, Dr. Firozaji Godrej, and to Mr. Ranjit Hoskote. Thank you.